Hi everybody, this is Mrs Cooper with a revision video on The Duchess of Malfi by John Webster and A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. Um, perhaps you might be studying this for your A-level exams. Um, okay, so here on the screen is just a list of some of the key shared themes I've noticed that have been coming up in the exam questions, particularly for um, EDUCAS and WJEC. Um, they seem to be centred around these core themes of identity, or sexuality, gender, family, power, society, tragedy, and violence. So if you're looking to revise, um, I would concentrate on these key themes. Any quotations, try and fit into these themes where you can. Ideally, try and pick key quotations that you can fit into multiple themes, um, because if you're studying for the EDUCAS exam, um, you need to learn these quotations by heart. Um, so the better um, amount of themes that a quotation can fit into, um, the better prepared you are for whatever comes up in the exam. OK, so here on this slide are some of the key symbols and images that are used in a streetcar. Um, particularly for AO2 when you're needing to analyse the use of key quotations or the use of symbolism or dramatic devices or recurring motifs. So take a look now and see which ones you can identify or which moments in the play you recognise here. OK, so in the top left hand corner, of course, you've got the um, Flamingo Hotel, which um, is where Blanche obviously was um, reported to have spent time with her elus elusive lovers, illicit lovers, um, and has gained this reputation for being unchaste, um, which, of course, sullies her um, hope for a potential positive future with Mitch. Next to it on the right hand side, you've got the um, paper Chinese lantern, which of course links to this theme of um, illusion. We've got Blanche trying to maintain this illusion of youth by placing the paper lantern over uh, the light. And of course, you have the dramatic scene where that's ripped off by Mitch when he discovers the, um, the truth of Blanche's past of the Hotel Flamingo um, and that illusion is ruined. Next hand side, um, on the right hand side, you've got the um, recurring motif of bathing where Blanche is trying to we see her repeatedly um, using the bath which of course frustrates um, Stanley and um, this is a recurring motif that's used to try and show Blanche's desire to overcome her sins of the past and her sullied reputation um, but of course we know that she's never able to because she continues to make the same mistakes um, as in the past and she also continues to face oppression from um, patriarchal figures within the play such as Stanley. Next to it on the right you've got this idea of heartbreak which of course is um, and pain and suffering which is one of the key themes in the play. Um, we learn about Blanche's timeline and her very earliest romantic relationship um, being full of heartbreak with um, Alan Gray and what happened um, when he, she discovered his affair, presumably with another man, um, uh, which led to him feeling shame and being confronted by Blanche, which immediately led to the suicide. Um, and that continues to haunt her throughout the play, which the audience sees on stage through Tennessee A. Williams' use of plastic theatre in his use of the recurring um, music of the uh, Varsuviana, which is used when Blanche has that flashback to that moment um, where Alan Gray took his own life. On the second row on the left hand side, you of course got this really important um, relationship between big sister and little sister with Blanche and Stella. And at times those roles often get reversed and there's a bit of a power struggle in certain scenes where both sisters feel caught in the, these kind of um, roles that they, they've been playing and frustration within these roles. Um, and then ultimately they, we have loving moments between them, but at the end we do see um, if we go with the original script, we see that Stella chooses her lover over her loyalty to her sister. 
On the right hand side of that, you've got the vanity mirror, which is linked to this theme of um, vanity that we see with Blanche being quite sort of obsessive with her appearance, trying to put on airs, trying to dress in a certain way to attract um, male attention, um, whether that's positive or negative, um, which could be viewed to be really her downfall, her attraction and desire to men um, and how that plays out in the role could be seen to actually cause the tragic downfall of the play. Next to that you have the um, luggage cases which of course Blanche arrives with uh, and then they are rifled through by Stanley when he's trying to look for the deeds at Tabel Reeve. This can perhaps be seen as, as a precursor for the later violent acts that Stanley then takes against Blanche by raping her the rummaging through her clothing, the destroying of her objects um, is very much linked to the clothing is so linked to Blanche's identity that this is a moment, in my opinion, of foreshadowing for that further act of violence by Stanley. On the right hand side, you have a moth um, that Blanche is likened to a moth. Um, that moth imagery is used to show Blanche's fragility. And of course, moths are attracted to light, which is in my opinion, symbolic of Blanche's attraction to males and sort of the light that that might bring her in her life. But of course, moths get hurt by light um, when they get too close, which also shows Blanche's failed relationships. On the bottom left, you've got the whiskey bottle, which shows uh, Blanche's alcoholism and use of alcohol as a crutch, which she ha she tries to hide from um, Stella and Stanley. And that um, recurs throughout the dramatic action of the play and is used to show Blanche's um, fragility that's hidden behind the surface and how she uses um, alcohol as a coping mechanism for any suffering she experiences from the past or in that moment in time. She often reaches for the, the Coke and the whiskey to try and get her through that moment and maintain that sort of um, mask, as it were. To the right of the whiskey bottle, we've got the um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning poetry. Um, this is a symbol to show that Blanche is well read. She's an educated woman. She notices the inscription on Mitch's um, cigar case and she's able to quote it directly. She has an experience as an English teacher and she's often able to quote poetry and verse from other languages. Um, and it's that her intellectual level is often what keeps her on a level unable to connect with some of the other characters in the play that perhaps lack that educational background to Blanche. To the right of that, we've got musical notes which link to either the blue piano music, which is the um, recurring motif that heightens the tragic theme and the melancholy tone of the play because that recurs throughout. Um, but it also links to the Varsoviana music, which of course is used as a um, climactic, um, dramatic moment when scenes are building to that dramatic climax and Blanche is triggered in revisiting the past moment. Next on screen, um, the final symbol is of course Belle Reeve, um, which is really symbolic of the past and the death and the tragedy that Blanche has experienced. Um, we see that in the very dramatic monologue, the I took the blows monologue, when she's confronting Stella about her sense of abandonment, that she felt she had to deal with all of the death and decay at Belle Reeve. Don't forget that um, Blanche's time in Belle Reeve is acts as a microcosm for the, the, the bigger picture and the bigger message about many um, families that gained their wealth um, on plantations and, and due to slavery um, were, were left to kind of rot due to the abolition of slavery, which is obviously a good thing. Um, but Blanche, just like many other families, were unable to move on from this and diversify uh, and gain new methods of wealth uh, and lost all that airs and graces. Um, and of course, Stella represents part of the same family, the Dubois family, but Stella was able to be adaptable and move to New Orleans and gain a new life with the um, new wave immigrant, Stanley. She represents a more adaptable, malleable um, character type, whereas Blanche represents um, those characters that are stuck in the past and unable to move on.
Okay, and here is the same sort of grid, but for the Duchess of Malfi. So take a moment now to have a look at these symbols and think which moments in the play or which symbols or motifs or themes um, are you reminded of when you view these? OK, so on the top left, we've got the um, fountains, which links to Antonio's um, discussion that he has at the start with Delio when he's explaining and he uses a, a fountain um, image when he's trying to explain the corruption that he's witnessed in court and, and how refreshed he feels after going um, away and seeing how um, modern courts can run and how healthy they can be and he quotes that um, if the fountain be poisoned at its head then throughout the land corruption will spread and that's not a direct quotation um, but do have a look there because that's a really key quotation and key moment in the play which sets up the whole dramatic action of the play that the tragedy is essentially caused by society and a corrupt society rather than one individual um, which is one of the key ideas in the genre of revenge tragedy that the play conforms to that this is not about a flawed individual per se um, this is about a flawed society and therefore that the um the tragic action of the play is not just and fitting with the flawed individual. Individual, it is more of a um, negative comment on a flawed society. Okay, so next to the fountains on the right hand side, you've got a candle there, um, which is um, linked to the light and dark imagery that recurs endlessly throughout the play. We have lots of scenes that are supposed to take place under the, under the cover of darkness, um, which leads to a lot of mistaken identities, which is another um, symbol within this grid. Um, but really do have a look at that light and dark imagery throughout the play, because it's used to heighten the um, irony and the tragic action of the play. OK, to the right of that, you've got the mask, um, which is not only linked to this idea of deceit and lies and, and um, hidden identity, but also the performative action within the play. We see lots of um, performative moments. We see masquerades. We see the dumb show. Um, we see Bossola dressing up in disguise um, when he goes to a, you know, torment the Duchess. So that's a key um, dramatic device used within the play. To the right hand side, of course, you've got the werewolf there, which links to um, Ferdinand's lycanthropia, lycanthropia um, which is, of course, that disease that he um, gets diagnosed with when he believes he's becoming a werewolf. That is foreshadowed early in the play. There's lots of references to him being under the moon. Um, and then, of course, sort of the blood loss that he has for his sister and then he actually believes that um, the doctor diagnoses with it him with it later on um, it was actually a real disease um, during that time believed by some practitioners um, so it, it links to the the wider theme in the play of madness or feigned madness which is, of course is another key theme in the revenge tragedy genre on the next row, you've got this jewel here. Jewels are a really key symbol in the play. We've got um, the Duchess of Malfi at the start when she's trying to um, bargain with her brothers who at the very start really clearly states to her that she is not to remarry now that she's a widow. And she makes this lovely quotation about how um, diamonds that travel through jewellers' hands and again in value when they're trying to argue that um, a woman decreases in value the more lovers they have. And it's a really modern um, spin that she takes on it and it's a really assertive moment when the Duchess actually stands up to her brothers at the start. And of course the audience at that time um, might view this in very different ways. Um, some might view it as quite um, outrageous really for her to stand against her brother's wishes and make this claim. Others might view her as being a very progressive modern woman um, and quite a positive role model for women at that time. Um, of course, you have the moment where Antonio uses the um, feigned 
crime of the Duchess's jewels and are being stolen as a cover up for when she goes into labour, which is, of course, induced by um, the apricots that Bossola feeds the Duchess. So we do see this as a real key um, symbol in the play. To the right of that, we've got the blood, which, of course, is linked to the revenge tragedy. There is lots of blood and gore in this play. You've got the um, severed hand. You've got lots and lots of violent imagery used by Ferdinand throughout when he wants to, he explains in graphic detail about what he wants to do to the Duchess and her um, mysterious husband, who doesn't know the identity, um, and her children, um, such as boil them, put them in a collar, feed them to the husband. Um, and of course, it does link to the genre and it shows Ferdinand's absolute hatred towards his sister. On the right of that, we've got the poniard, um, which also links to Ferdinand's um, graphic and violent imagery that he uses um, and the actual action that he takes when he pretends to stab the Duchess with the poniard in a very jokey manner. Um, but of course, the audience, through the dramatic irony, we can see that there's more to this. Um, it's a very sexualized image. It can be read from a Freudian perspective um, as his um, unfulfilled sexual desire towards his uh, sister, his incestuous desire, as obviously the poniard is, is a phallic symbol. Um, and it also foreshadows the later torture that he'll um, go on to um, force his sister under to undertake. To the right of the poniard, we've got um, the whispering symbol, um, lies, reputa uh, lies and deceit and rumours are rife in this play. Uh, we've got lots of passed on information, hidden and secret scenes um, such as the cardinal um, and uh, Julia. We've got lots of hidden secret um, moments that come out in the play, so it's a key theme. On the bottom left, you've got this symbol that's supposed to show deeds and land, um, which, of course, is used throughout the play um, as property is passed. The cardinal is supposed to lose some of his land and um, later on in the play to show his loss of power. Um, so have a look at that one in perhaps more detail. To the right of that, you've got the use of music throughout the play, which is if you think about um, when you've got the procession of madmen coming on intended to torture the Duchess, we see that to a musical, um, a song, an interlude. Um, and that's in a similar way, we can see madness being linked to music, both here in the in the Duchess of Malfi and in Streetcar. Of course, you've got the nectarine there next to the music symbol. Um, and if you have a look, food in particular and drink is used in both plays Streetcar and the Duchess of Malfi often as a kind of weaponized um, symbol we've got the alcohol and the coke in Streetcar and we've got the apricots here um, so there's a really lovely link between food and drink in both plays that you could explore and then finally on the right hand side we've got identity and mistaken identity and rumours and, and reputation being a massive theme in both plays. Okay, so um, just a quick question for you then. If you are studying the EDUCAS um, WJEC exam board, these are all the AOs that you are assessed on in the Streetcar and Duchess of Malfi exam, but which one is the one that's worth double weighting? Is it AO1, AO2, AO3, AO4 or AO5? AO1 being your understanding and your use of supporting, good supporting quotations and your fluency of expression. AO2 being your analysis of dramatic and literary devices. AO3 being your application of contextual knowledge. AO4 being your comparison of both plays. And AO5 being how you um, use other um, interpretations to inform your own interpretation of the plays, such as um, literary criticism or the quotations of critics, etc. 
And yeah, hopefully you got it. So AO4, the comparison, uh, comparison element is worth double weighting here in this exam. So it's really, really important that when you're writing up your essay, you're using that interwoven um, essay style. You're not just talking about a streetcar in one chunk and then Duchess of Malfi. You're interweaving the discussion of all of the AOs, finding quotations that link, finding linking motifs or linking themes and analysing them within the same paragraph and then moving on to a next moment and Streetcar and Duchess of Malfi within the same paragraph and etc. OK, here's just a reminder of the assessment grid. If you're studying for the WJEC slash EDUCAS examination board, um, those are all the AOs okay, uh, that you're assessed on. Um, obviously, band one is the lowest and band five is the highest. And here is my little student friendly kind of simplification of what all of the AOs mean. Here's some ideas that I would want to include if I was um, thinking about revising for the exam and all of the AOs. He was a brilliant knowledge organiser for the Duchess of Malfi and Streetcar. You might want to pause it on this and do a print screen. I hope this was helpful. Bye.